Well, good day. How's it going? So here I am down in the basement, finishing up final days, getting out of this place. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so we've done all the um, perspective stuff. We'll just have one more look down the wall, just in case we miss something. Because it seems some people still still don't understand perspective. See how all those parallel lines? There's only one which is level or horizontal. Only one. It's not one of my eye because the camera's not at eye level. There we go. Now it's at eye level. See that? That one is level and horizontal. See the one beneath it appears to be converging upwards. See the one above it appears to be converging downwards. That's convergence. I get sick of having to repeat that word. I have to put in capital letters and hyphenate it. Convergence. It's a thing. It, it is a law, but it, it, it's not set in scientific terms simply because the damn stupid bloody obvious in front of your eyes shouldn't have to be called a law it shouldn't even have to you know even Newton's laws shouldn't have to be put in place shouldn't have to be stated a thing at rest stays at rest unless you kick it or you apply a force to it that's that's not a law that's just common sense so Oh, that's right, this is meant to be part two of the video of um, perspective. And it's meant to be an addendum, an add-on, not an addendum, to the introduction which I put on the modern day debate, which I've conveniently finally got the link from James, thanks James, to um, upload. So now I'm going to waste some time using up the last of my bandwidth, which I paid for, to wait for the phone to upload. It could be hours. So in the meantime, I'm going to explain my introduction, which I made once again for the people who are a little bit slow in understanding how perspective works. So, convergence, hopefully, you've got. Light, on the other hand, is tricky. I mean, look at that big glare, and yet, in reality, it's just a neon tube. See it neoning away there? It's just a, a neon bulb. I might even go turn the other one on. It's actually a better light. I installed that one myself. Cause I'm um, a qualified electrician and stuff. <laughs> this one's a blue light. It's a much nicer sort of light, but it's still just a neon tube, as you can see. But the nature of light and the way exposure works tends to cause it to make a big bloody glow. So if we can do it with a frickin' light bulb so frickin' close, then why do we think the sun is what we think it is when it is obviously so far away? We're just seeing a glowing apparition of it. You can almost see it out that window there, but not quite. I mean, this whole room, I turned both those lights off. Now I'm in pitch black, black darkness because there's no direct sunlight whatsoever coming into this room. Does it look like it's complete pitch black darkness? I don't think so. There's two little windows there. Look at the big sun glow over there. It's like a big hotspot apparition under certain exposure circumstances. So this is the nature of light. It's exposure. 
it's the retinas in our eyes it's the the um god what are those things called in cameras again i used to know that back in the days when cameras had shutters and all that sort of stuff it's um the nature of light is gen generally about exposure and relativity <laughs> that's one thing i agree that can be relative is the nature of light because you can see it as it just as a move around the nature of light keeps changing because this camera is made to adjust to best light conditions and so as i move around in this massive big basement that people have been accusing me of living in all this time because it's not my mother's actually no nah, it's someone else's but i've been living here for ages in fact i can even go on a bit of a virtual tour of the house while i'm doing this because why the hell not this is my little brewery room it's in there it's got its own little window its own little nature of light and it's got a fluoro thing and it's got an even better echo in here this one's like echoing off the walls and stuff so this would have been an ideal place to build a little kitchenette and bathroom but because we live on septic systems around here it's too far underground to match up with the septic system so as you walk back up to ground level we can see part of the house that I've been living in for the past 10 years and finally getting out of and I'm still going to talk about the nature of light while I do this you know because it's a um, fun thing to do this was the guest bedroom it's a big big room very high ceilings chandeliers and shit like why the fuck <laughs> why the absolute fuck with the fucking landlord or landlady land thing um put fucking chandeliers in a fucking bedroom that's what i'd like to know but that's what it did there's another chandelier that's just like the little entrance room this is where all my mess is now currently left in so that's still a moon chart on the wall last picture hanging um this is one of the bedrooms i think this was the oh no oh fuck no it's still got something akin to a chandelier in it a bedroom light yep that's the sort of shit i've had to deal with in the 10 years of living here got good security screens there and lovely view outside and the main road and shit all this shit i'm saying goodbye to it was my last day so you know i'm having a drink while i'm doing it um then we got the lovely fireplace gotta love the fireplace beautiful and another useless waste of space in the room so you know this is what i've been paying shit loads of money and rent for for ages for shit loads of wasted space this room is the one where the ex-husband of the land thing blew his head off with a hunting rifle so put a chandelier there but yeah you can't get rid of the blood stains can you actually it's not a blood stain it's just where the paint won't stick because apparently when you blow your brains out with a hunting rifle when the brains hit the roof doesn't matter what you scrub it with paint will never stick so you know we've got a nice balcony little backyard all the mod cons and shit man like it's all fucking happening so <laughs> nature of light oh look yeah a fucking chandelier it's a bedroom gotta have a fucking chandelier because fuck chandeliers man fucking chandeliers like wall light no no way fucking chandeliers man fucking chandeliers fuck me <laughs> anyway so Let's get back to the nature of light. This is the kitchen. I like the kitchen. It was always one of my 
favourite kitchens I've ever had, actually. Just, even this time of day, I'd actually get direct sunlight. I don't know if you can see it, but there it is. Direct sunlight. Streaming through the window. Bloody hell. That's part of the nature of light. It's bloody bright. I don't even need that one on. I can turn it off for the moment. Because I've got a sunlight up there as well. Fucking light all over the place. And yet, downstairs there was no direct light. I don't know if you've seen it, but this wall behind me, that's where the sun is shining from at the moment. Downstairs, that one's buried underground. Like, fully underground. That out there is a shed. And it is above the roof level. So in all that darkness, still sunlight gets in, which is not sunlight at all. It is daylight. Big difference. Um, so as I said in my introduction, getting around to it, you know, eventually, in the introduction about the... Um, nature of light is similar to a fish underneath the surface of a frozen lake and I, I use the the frozen bit um, very specifically because I believe that's akin to what our firmament is. I believe our firmament is more than likely ice or something frozen, possibly hydrogen. Now, people tell me that hydrogen is some massively cold, like minus 250-something degrees, and I'm thinking, yep, that seems to work for me. This heat doesn't come from the sun. Even though it is much warmer in the sunlight, I might just walk back out there since I've got no bloody shirt on. It's coming into winter. <laughs> it's hot one minute and then it's cool the next. <sighs> it's sunlight. It's good for you. It's good for what ails you. <laughs> and this is what ails me. Sparkling ails. So... If a fish is underneath the surface of a frozen lake, when it looks towards the sun, much like I'm doing through this window, see how I did that? Me either. Um, it just sees a hotspot apparition of the sun on the ice. And as it swims slowly through the cold water, that hotspot tends to follow it. Now I noticed driving home today that um <laughs> driving home driving to X home <laughs> today is that um the sun seemed to be following me as well. Like didn't matter how far I went, it still stay, stayed in the same apparent position. So for the fish under the ice it doesn't really know that the ice is ice. It just knows it can't go any higher than it. And if it does, it you know, bumps its snout into it. Fish snout. <laughs> um, bumps its fishy protrusion of its mouth into it. And it can go no further. And so for all intents and purposes to the fish, that is the sun. And it seems to be, for all intents and purposes, the very source of heat and light to it. And from the emanation of that apparition, the water seems to glow to a certain distance. Like as far as it can see, it's roughly the equivalent of daylight. Now, you've got another fish 500 metres away in the same lake. They can't see each other. They don't exist to each other because they can't see each other and they can't telepathically communicate to one another. 
So what they're doing is fishing around, doing their fishy business, and the fish 500 metres away, he is looking through the ice at the sun and sees his own personal hotspot apparition of the sun, and for all intents and purposes to him, it's the sun. It's the source of heat, the source of light. It's the sun. And then eventually... As the fish evolve and become like hipsters and shit, and they get their mobile phones and they talk to one another and they say, Hey, bro, I'm looking at the sun over here. And the other one goes, Yeah, man, I can see the sun too. We must be looking at the same thing. Let's uh, do some mathematics. And so the fish, being really clever and shit, because they've got the technology now, they can talk to one another. They go, all right, well, I'll measure angle of the sun here. You measure angle of the sun there. And and they do. And they get two completely different measurements because they're looking at two completely different apparitions of the same thing in a completely different place in the ice. And from that, they're able to calculate exactly how circular their fucking lake is. And not, I don't just mean circular as in round I mean spherical oblately spherical spherical I fucking like that oblately spherical this is how they can do it by measuring the angles of the apparition that they can personally see in two completely different places and this is how we know that we live on an oblately spherical Okay, an oblate spheroid spinning millions and millions of miles an hour through fucking space because the, sh the angles of shadows at different places are different. That's how we know it. We've known it for thousands of years. So anyway, I'll try and be serious if I can. It's a bit hard once I let my hair down. <laughs> Fucking hell, I crack myself up. Um, I do not. I'd never. Crack. So basically what I'm trying to say is when you're looking at your own personal hotspot apparition through a firmament above us, which I believe is a frozen layer of ice, Probably flat, maybe dome shaped. The dome shaped bit does kind of make sense with some of the evidence we can see, but you know, a dome shaped layer of ice above a lake has never made sense to me. Um, some of the biblical explanations of the firmament, which they call raphia, translate as stretched out like a tarpaulin. Um, beaten flat like um, like sheet metal or the other one is kind of like like molten glass which again that's the way we make a mirror for example is by putting molten glass onto a, a pool of mercury because you know, liquid mercury is probably the, the most level surface we could possibly have and by doing that, it sets, so you've got perfectly flat glass to give you a perfect mirror finish. So, and there's places like Lake Bacal in the USSR, if it's not formally known as that, <laughs> Russia, somewhere over in, you know, Northeast Asia area. Um, Lake Bacal is 400 miles long and it freezes over every winter and it's known as the flattest place on earth, 400 miles. Now we know for a fact that um, the Suez Canal, it's about 100 miles long. You also got the Deng Shang Quang, whatever it is. There's a bridge in China, it's also 100 miles long. 
and both of them have taken no curvature into consideration whatsoever. And at 100 miles, you are missing, in rounded figures, 7,000 feet of missing curvature. That's a massive amount of missing curvature that just doesn't exist, which means, therefore, the globe, the oblate spheroid that you believe in, must be compensating somewhere. It has to compensate for a massive amount of missing curvature, which is never seen. It's always somewhere over there, out of sight, out of mind. So, um, yeah, maybe it's just easier to, to think logically and truthfully and honestly and say, well, if water is level and it doesn't curve, and we are missing 7,000 feet of curvature in 100 miles, maybe there is no curvature. Maybe the Earth really is flat. And so, therefore, <laughs> coming back to the nature of light, which is pretty much what I'm trying to bang on about, I'll keep forgetting because I get sidetracked, is that um, the firmament, obviously, then, is hell aloft due to the same function, function, feature, same principle, same thing that keeps the frozen ice aloft above a frozen lake. And once it freezes, then the water beneath is sort of free to be fluid and so forth. Unless it gets really, really cold. But our atmosphere is really, really freaking high. Like, to the best of my knowledge, and you know, I am guessing here because I have no idea really exactly how high it might be, but I'm guessing it's in the range of somewhere between 35 and 71 miles, which suggests it may be dome shaped. <laughs> Again, you know. We just don't know. So you, you can't claim what you don't know. But I'm guessing it's at least 35 miles high. And I, I tend to go for the figure of 65 miles. Don't know why. It's just my gut. And so at 65 miles of height, as we know, it gets colder and colder as we get higher and higher. Hence, many mountains are ice capped all year round. But, yeah, they never defrost, but they're also constantly releasing ice melt and therefore yeah, they still have streams flowing from them. But they also coagulating <laughs> that's not the right word coagulating is not the right word but I like it because it sounds good coagulating <laughs> they're also condensing moisture from the air as it cools down so as the winds pass it which replenish the ice it's kind of like a, a dehumidifier in perpetual motion in the reality of the existence of the realm we live upon and that's pretty much what everything is. And so as you get higher and higher and higher, of course, you get less and less oxygen because oxygen is quite dense. So it's mostly concentrated at sea level. That's why some athletes like to train at high elevations because it gives them the advantage of adapting their body to um, pardon me, being used to operating at lower oxygen levels. So that then when they compete against other people who are used to higher oxygen levels, they have an advantage because, you know. So, anyway, everything operates according to density and buoyancy. That's why the ground beneath me is firm, but the air I'm walking through is not so firm. That's why I can walk through it. But, you know, if I put myself up high in the air, and removed something dense from beneath me to support me or resist me, I'd drop through it. 
until I hit something of resistance, which would probably hurt like I'm a fucker. So, <laughs> oops, I did say that out loud. I tried to edit myself. So, everything exists according to density and buoyancy, and everything finds its place according to density and buoyancy, relative density. Like, the glass is more dense than the beer, so therefore it resists it until it finds a place of least resistance and it falls down my throat. But notice, it always goes back to level. Unlike me, who's getting a little bit tipsy. So, because of this density and buoyancy gradient, and we have a wide variety of gases. Now, we just think of air as air, but it's not. You've got burps and farts, for example. You've got oxygen, and hydrogen, and nitrogen, and helium. Well, everybody knows if you put helium into a balloon, you can see the visual effects of it being less dense than air, and it rises. But if you didn't put it into a balloon, it's still going to rise, you just can't see it because gases are basically not visible to our eyes. So in the planar Earth that we live upon, you still have this range of gases and they all have different densities that will... They're fluid, okay, so they will intermingle get it on with one another, but in the overall sense on a really big scale, they will more or less find their place. Much like we've all seen a density tower, you know, you've got your detergents and your oils and waters and ink and whatnot. You, we've all seen a density tower. All these things find their place due to density, and the more dense something is, the more it will push through the less dense until it reaches a place of resistance. And that is the, the key to understanding density and buoyancy. Buoyancy is resistance. If um, it doesn't have sufficient density to resist something, it won't give it buoyancy, like air for most things, except for, say, helium. But... So that's your density and buoyancy sorted out. Getting back to the firmament again, as I'm slowly getting around to, is due to this density and buoyancy, the lighter gases such as hydrogen and helium get to the uppermost levels to the point where it's so cold they freeze. And that is what I believe creates the firmament. Modern science will tell us that uh, the sun is fusing hydrogen into helium, and they call that fusion. And so the sun is a big nuclear fusion ball. However, my concept of it is the sun, I've always said it's an interdimensional portal, but to understand what that actually means, a little bit trickier. It's an interdimensional portal much higher than the firmament and this portal as I call it isn't like a, a portal that you can just jump through type of thing. It's more of a an angel. I think an angel is the best way to describe it. It's, it's a living conscious being who is up there in heaven, as everything above the firmament is, that's the heavens. You know, that goes without saying. We don't have to make anything biblical or religious about this. It's just the heavens. And all of these enlightened beings are angels. And the sun who is actually Lucifer, the light bearer. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
It's a funny one, that isn't it? <laughs> We've been thinking of it as Jesus all this time, but it's actually Lucifer. <laughs> Surrounded by his faithful twelve apostles. So Lucifer the light bearer is the angel above the firmament, and it is the greater one of them all. And the energy that it transmutes through the portal that it is is what reacts in the firmament to create physical light that we can see. And that's why we see stars as well. They're doing the exact same thing, but they're just very, very weak and tiny little ones in comparison to the great one, the only one. There can only be one. And in the daytime, that is the truth. There can only be one. <laughs> Even though somebody tried to make a moon. Or somebody did make a moon. And it works pretty well, but you know, it's very dim in the daylight compared to the sun. So the sun being an interdimensional portal of energy. Now that's the thing you have to try and keep in mind. It's not so much an interdimensional portal that physical things can go through, but it's an interdimensional portal into another dimension. That's what interdimensional means. We don't, we can't, we do not. <laughs> it's impossible. I cannot explain other dimensions. All I can say is that they are not physical. They are Dimensional, they are of light, they are of energy. And the way that that energy transforms itself into this physical dimension that we live upon is as light. And it reacts in the firmament, a chemical reaction, and it literally transfuses or transforms the hydrogen into helium. Thus, we have sunlight, much like the glowing orb of a welder's arc. That is literally what our individual hotspot apparition of the sun is. It's our personal view between us and the interdimensional portal in the firmament, creating our individual hotspot that is literally transforming hydrogen into helium, creating the bright glowing apparition that we think is the sun. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? So from there, between there and nearly all the way down to the surface of Earth, like if I'm saying that's 65 miles high, which I'm guesstimating, but that's my guess today, mate. Um, I think that the sunlight region, or daylight region, I should say, pardon my Freudian slip there, it's daylight, not sunlight, is that the daylight region is only about 10, 12 miles high, maximum 15. I, I don't think it's 15, but you know, that blue haze we see in high altitude balloon footage, which I was alluding to, is the advantage that we have today, modern optics have, that our forefathers did not have. They were not able to send a camera up to 130,000 feet or 23 miles to see what we can see today. But now that we can see it, we can deduce a better explanation for what we do see. And we do see that that blue haze isn't as high as we'd like to think. Sometimes people will fly in um, airplanes that can go quite high, 
much higher than the normal 30 or 35,000 feet of commercial flights. But when they send one up above 60,000 feet, they start to think that they're in the limits of space. And the reason they say that is because, well, one thing, air gets so rarefied, it's hard to gain lift, and it gets dark because they're above the neon gases, like the neon bulbs I was showing before, with the nature of light. Um, it's dark because there's nothing in the atmosphere for light to react with to create light. So daylight only reaches this 10 to 12, possibly 15 miles high. And from there, they think they're in space. <laughs> Which I guess technically they are, they're in dark space. Dark matter. If you mind, it matters. If you don't mind, it doesn't. That is actually really deep. If you think about it, but don't think about it. It's too deep. Nobody wants to think deeply these days. We just want to think about simple shit. Like, if you believe they put a man on the moon, man on the moon. So I just heard the gate open. I think we've got a visitor. <laughs> Maybe not. So anyway. Anyway. Where was we? That's where we was. The nature of light. bug in that. Damn it. Hell. It happens. Would have been good protein if I swallowed it. So the nature of light isn't what we think it is. On the other side of the firmament, okay, well, no. I'm just getting advice here now that I'm not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> All right, bugger it. It would be interesting to share that. But on this side of the firmament, I'm allowed to talk about everything. And apparently... Wow. <laughs> I know, I know, it's weird, eh? So when we see that hotspot apparition of the sun, even that is not where we're seeing it. <laughs> That's the weird thing. That's probably why they say it takes eight minutes for the light to reach us, because when it hits there, it's still got to reach the, the daylight part of the atmosphere. It's almost like, oh, damn, I, I wish I couldn't upload images. I have a really good one and save to my um, images on Facebook or sorry images that I can share on Facebook you just can't share them on um, YouTube the way I'd like but the ancient Egyptians have pictures where they show that they've got nut or nut however you call her nut is the firmament and she stretches right over and all the stars and that's sort of in her body and she is kind of dome shaped but she's very flat across the top and then but beneath that they've got various layers of almost like second and third and in some cases fourth and fifth um, firmaments which it's a terrible word for it because they're not firm at all they're just gas but what each one of these does each one of them produces a different layer of 
existence um, of gaseous emissions that create light. Yeah, the, the lowest one is basically, well, no, it's not even the lowest, but one of the lowest ones is cloud level. So that's where, you know, water, evaporation, condenses into what we call clouds, and that's basically where it starts getting cold above that. So that's sort of the the warm temperature, the warm temperate zone that uh, humans exist in. But above that, you've got various layers and different levels of Let's call them beings. Conscious beings exist. And that's where they do their thing. And that's where our daylight exists. Now this is... I don't even know if I can explain it because it does get really weird. We'll go back to the fish for, for a second. The fish under the layer of ice is seeing its zone of daylight around it. And at a certain distance to him, or her, or to fish, <laughs> to, to the fish it seems dark, because it just can't see that far. And so in the darkness, for all intents and purposes, it is dark. But to the other fish, beyond its visible range, it exists in a place of light where it also has a range of visible light around it where fish one is existing in darkness. But fish one thinks it's living in light. Fish two thinks it's living in light. To one another, they're both living in darkness. if that made much sense because it, it seems illogical it seems ridiculous and yet that is the nature of light what you see is what you get what somebody else is seeing is what they get <laughs> and this is where Mark Twain actually comes into it because I like Mark Twain. <laughs> he got his name from a, something to do with boating. Mark Twain. Because it means mark the position between two different things. And the saying basically is, the twain shall never meet. I can say that again in case you missed it. The twain shall never meet. And with that, I think I'll just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's been great chatting with you all. And I look forward to seeing you on the other side. You know the day destroys the night. Night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide. Break on through to the other side. <laughs>